is having a conversation, they're engaged, raising their eyebrows, uh-huh, uh-huh, then somebody says something that they don't like and they do a really fast contempt overlaying their... Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Ilse Samarripa and this is The World Space. Today we have a very important guest. Her name is Melinda Osel. She's a specialist in movement and facial expression. So before we start, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. She studied psychology, personality and assessment in the laboratory of Zurich. She has worked in some amazing things like character art direction, AI tracking and even building technologies for emotional tracking. So I think she's a very interesting person. Hi, Melinda. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here today. Hi, Ilse. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm really glad to be here on your show. Excited to talk about facial expressions. The pleasure is ours. So the other day, you and I were talking about facts, a facial action coding system. Would you mind sharing with us a little bit more about that, uh, how you got into it and what it is? Yeah, totally. So the facial action coding system, or F-A-C-S, pronounced Facts, like fax machine, is a breakdown of all the human facial movements in the most foundational points. For example, instead of just relying on muscle movements, because our muscles of our face, unlike other muscles, are attached directly to our skin, you can see all the visible movements. And so fax focuses on the visual movements of the face. It represents them in something called action units. Action units represent either a portion of a single muscle or a single muscle or a group of muscles. For example, the frontalis muscle, which covers your forehead. It's one muscle, but it can be moved in discrete units, either outer brow raise, inner brow raise, or outer plus inner. If you're looking at the muscle nomenclature, it's frontalis pars lateralis or frontalis pars medialis. So medialis would be inner brow raiser and lateralis would be outer brow raiser. It makes it easier for naming. So in fact, inner brow raiser is just AU1, short for action unit one or inner brow raiser. And the outer part is called AU2, which is short for outer brow raiser. On the other side of the spectrum, if we talk about the multiple muscles involved, it's very uncommon for people to furrow their brow without using all three different muscles that are activated together. So in the facial action coding system, furrow is called brow lowerer, and it's action unit four, and it uses three different muscle groups. It's a lot easier to refer to different movements when you're calling them by action units or facts wording instead of listing all the long Latin muscle names associated with brow furrow. Wow, thank you. So. Please tell us what drove you to start working on this. How did you know that this was like a whole world of things that you could actually exploit? To be totally candid with you, it was actually a huge struggle at the beginning. So when I first learned facts, I became certified in it. There's a, a test you can take, it's actually very difficult. And once you pass the test with a certain percentage, you can be a certified fax coder. I used them in sales for a while. I did direct to consumer sales. I was able to make my money by reading people's reactions, engaging if they were interested in the product. Eventually, I got contracted for a position at Facebook or Oculus because their virtual reality and augmented reality sectors were interested in understanding facial movements more. So that's how I started all in that. And then I developed my knowledge even further in a machine learning sense. So I was working on avatar technology and one of the artists, character artists on our team was interested in learning more about facial expressions. So I band together with him and we worked on a lot of blend shapes together. I left Facebook in October and now I'm at a company called Affectiva. They are focused on something called emotion AI, which is building technology that can recognize emotions. And we're using that right now in the automotive industry. They're also very heavily focused in the marketing industry as well. You and I have been talking and you clearly understand emotion in a technical way better than anyone I've ever known. So I wanted to ask you, how can you extrapolate this to animation? How, for example, if I have a character, how can I make an emotional transition that looks more natural, that looks more realistic? My main advice is always be aware of context. Context, context, context is so important. For example, it depends on what type of goal you're trying to achieve. For different emotions, they have different associated speeds. If you're doing surprise, for example, surprise is considered to be one of the quickest emotions because inherently it's reacting to something before you fully process it. 
Whereas fear is you've assessed that something is dangerous and so you're having a negative response to it. It's important to be aware of things like this and you may have to do a little bit of research outside of your typical zone of where you may expect to do research. Looking into plastic surgery journals, psychology journals, that's gonna be really helpful for you, even marketing. For example, one thing that I came across while researching marketing material was people have greater trust associations when a smile onset is slow, so people perceive that as more genuine, whereas if you had a fast smile, people are more likely to view that as not trustworthy. And so depending on what you're trying to achieve with your character, if you want your character to be putting off some sort of sketchy vibe, you would probably want to make the smile occur faster. If you wanted the character to be warm, friendly, with a trustworthy perception to others, you would make the smile happen slowly. Not all facial expressions are created equally, whether it's an emotion or just a general communication expression, there's different timing for everything. It's important to pay attention to what kind of expression. You can have a general expression, micro expression, you can have an emotion expression. If it's a conversational eyebrow raise, it will stay on the face a lot longer, possibly have a slower onset. If it is a surprise-based eyebrow raise, it will be quicker on the face less time and happen a lot faster. Another thing would be to look into the speed of micro expressions if you really wanna get detailed and make your work colorful. Micro expressions are extremely short. They happen before we even have awareness of them. That's why they would be useful to throw in when a character is leaking information and not necessarily intending to express it. They can be as small as 1 25th of a second. Paul Ekman and Wallace Friesen traveled the world and studied various cultures and what type of emotion expressions they give off and how they perceive emotions. So they developed a list of prototypic emotions. Originally there were six, but after they did the research, Ekman wished that he had included contempt. Contempt is the seventh expression, so it's not always included. It depends who you're talking to. The six emotions are happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, and disgust. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any tips on how to understand facial expressions around emotions that you can share with us? Micro expressions are gut reactions that we have that show up on our face. They happen before we know they're happening. We can't control them because they're so fast. Like I said, they can be as fast as 1 25th of a second. And if that's the case, the only way you can really control your micro expressions is if you have Botox or if you control your internal state. If you can control how you're feeling, you can control your micro expressions. Macro expressions, on the other hand, are typically above one half a second. They can be one to four seconds, maybe even longer. They're things that you would express in conversation or if you were holding an emotion reaction, allowing that reaction to be shown to other people. That's when a macro expression would happen. For example, when I'm raising my eyebrows to emphasize words and speech, that is considered a macro expression. The main difference is micro is fast, super fast before you can even realize it. Macro is typically longer. You can control your macro expressions. And in terms of how they work together, you could have a macro expression happening first and depending on when you would want the micro expression to come into play. Let's say somebody is having a conversation, they're engaged, raising their eyebrows, uh-huh, uh-huh. Then somebody says something that they don't like and they do a really fast contempt overlaying their engaged face. That can be one way to play it off. So there's just an infinite way of methods you could do to play around with micro and macro expressions. There's a researcher named David Matsumoto. He has done a lot of research on micro expressions. Paul Ekman also has a lot of writings about micro expressions. I will also continue to be writing about all of these on my blog. I write a facial expression blog that talks about common things I know people are always wondering and confused about or things that I was wondering and confused about when I was learning about this. I think the modelers, the riggers, and the animators could be really interested in your cheat sheets. Could you tell them a little bit more about all these projects you do? I realized that a lot of the resources online were not good. They either had um, incorrect action units or they had action units contaminated with other action units. For example, it's really hard for most people to do an isolated cheek razor. A lot of people add lid tightener to it. So, and another thing that people do is they add lip corner puller. So, because people associate cheek razor and lip corner puller together because those two combined make 
joy expressions. It's very difficult to get actors who are skilled enough to isolate those expressions. So a lot of the cheat, a lot of the facial action coding system reference sheets out there are not the best quality. So I decided to make my own. You can find them on my website. It's melindaozell.com. Right now I have created an additional cheat sheet just for the upper face that has front view, side view, and an anatomy chart associated with each action unit. You usually record yourself having all this natural facial expressions, and I think it's so interesting. Would you please tell my audience a little bit about this? Yeah, so I figure if I'm going to be out here making facial expression references, why not capture myself when I'm having an authentic reaction? For example, I recently saw my regular acupuncture lady and I was like, you know, she said, today we're going to use some points that may hurt. And I was like, oh really? Maybe it's a great time to get some authentic pain expressions. So she let me record myself getting the acupuncture and I cut the video clips to see what the pain looked like. And I realized I expressed three different types of pain and that was really interesting to me. Another thing that I do sometimes is if I feel that I'm about to cry, I'll start recording myself crying. I have some videos of me laughing. I mean, laughing is pretty easy to get. There's also different types of laughter. So it's nice to pay attention to different types of laughter or crying or pain expressions because they're not always the same. It depends on what kind of pain. It depends on what kind of laughter, how, how intense it is. Um, another thing that I recently recorded was I was reading this really horrifying article and within the first two sentences of reading the article I knew I was gonna have some interesting expressions so I recorded myself reading it and when I'm recording myself reading things or reacting to things I do my best to just have it keep my face neutral and just allow things to come as they come instead of I do not hype it up I do not dampen it because it's important for me to preserve the integrity as much as I can I cannot fully say that there aren't subconscious influences going on but as far as I can tell my genuine reactions seem to be coming out as genuinely as I feel. Finally what would you advise anyone who wants to follow your footsteps? Because it's such a specific field a lot of people aren't aware of the value of it so it becomes disregarded. If you want to follow in my footsteps I would advise reaching out to me we can brainstorm some ways. There are different avenues you can take. I didn't expect to be in the machine learning world but I ended up here because that's where my time at Facebook took me and now I feel like it's hugely complimenting where the entertainment industry is moving because we're all moving in a direction of real-time tracking and because I have a leg up in working in real-time tracking, I am here at a good time. Because typical roles don't necessarily focus on detail enough, there's always room to become a specialist in so many different things. And it doesn't have to be the face, but if it's the face, talk to me. Super valuable. I thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's so fun for me to talk about this stuff. Bye everyone, thanks so much for stopping by. If you have any questions, reach out to me directly and I'm happy to talk to you. That was Melinda Osel. I think her work is truly amazing. Please make sure to check it out. If you liked this video and you loved Melissa's tips as much as I did, please give it a thumbs up and make sure to tell me in the comments what you learned, what you already knew. And if you want me to interview someone in particular for my next video, please subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate it. I upload videos every Thursday, World Space Thursday. Keep making art, you beautiful artist. Ciao.